Uh, our next speaker is Zhao D'Andrade. Uh, Zhao is recently, I think we can still say recently, moved to uh, Vanderbilt to uh, really help lead their uh, really formidable group uh, in interstitial lung disease. And I liked your title. This is provocative, should unclassifiable ILD be treated like IPF? Okay, thanks, thanks Zhao. Thank you. I have to adjust uh, the microphone. I'm the, the shortest one of the pack. So, thanks so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I've been tasked with uh, uh, the, answering the question of what, whether should unclassified by LD be treated like IPF. I was very tempted to have only, only uh, one slide that would say, heck, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but then I decided that uh, that wouldn't be enough. So, uh, that I'll have, I'll have a bit more data for you. These are my disclosures. And my first question as I was thinking about this, um, this question or, or this task was, what is unclassifiable ILD? Uh, who came up with this? It's actually, it's, there's a definition for the unclassifiable, which is a small subset of patients with uh, interstitial pneumonia that remains unclassifiable after extensive, and I want to emphasize the word extensive, clinical radiologic and or pathological examination and discussed by a multidisciplinary team. And how prevalent is this problem? Do, do, do this population uh, really exist? And, and there are many series out there, and, and I, I suspect that each group has different um, uh, thresholds for, for uh, accepting uncertainty, but the medium in the literature is about 10%, which is a substantial number of patients, uh, if you think. What are the causes of uh, unclassified by ILD? And, and generally, it's bad data or, or um, uh, not enough data. So if you look at most of the series that have been published, the main, um, the, the main uh, issue that leads to an unclassifiable um, classification is the lack of pathological information. So either your patient does not want to have a, have a biopsy or is unable to have a biopsy. And in some patients, the, the, both imaging and or tissue has been modified by uh, pretreatment. Uh, and, and, and sometimes uh, there are mixed patterns, both in imaging and, um, and tissue. So things get a little complicated. Uh, that also brings me to the question of, okay, it, it, we need to try very hard to classify a patient, but the question is how hard are we trying? Uh, I think that uh, uh, we, we, try, we attempted, our group, at, when I was at UAB, uh, we attempted to look into this by deploying uh, research coordinators to the offices of uh, non-academic uh, non, uh, practicing pulmonologists in, in the southeast. And if you look at the, the graph here, actually the, the data is, uh, it, it gives us pause. Uh, and I don't think this necessarily reflects what's happening uh, across or around the, con the country in all centers but it certainly is, uh, again, food for thought. Only about a quarter of the patients had the recommended serological evaluation. Only about a third of the images are actually were high-resolution CT. No patient who had been diagnosed with IPF had an MDD. And when uh, a surgical biopsy was performed, uh, in only about a third of the cases, three lobes were sampled. So uh, there was a, a certain setup for failure in terms of achieving the right classification. So we know now that I'm telling you that these patients exist and they're about 10% uh, of the cohort, but what are the characteristics of patients with uh, unclassified ILD? As you can see here, this is the, uh, uh, the group from Vancouver, published at ERJ 2013. Patients uh, compared to IPF, uh, IPF controls and non-IPF controls, those deemed to be unclassifiable uh, were uh, less likely to be male and uh, uh, had, uh, were, uh, were less likely to be, to be smokers, but in, in general had uh, uh, same levels of, uh, of physiologic impairment compared to the other groups. And obviously, it, it is, uh, when you establish a classification, it is important to, uh, to show that there is a prognostic, uh, a prognostic de determination here. And, and indeed, the prognosis is intermediate between those of IPF and non-IPF ILD, and, and again, so it's a sizable problem in a population that does not have um, uh, negligible, negligible uh, outcomes. And uh, just as any uh, patient with ILD, uh, it was good to see that their, their behavior is very similar, and HRCT scores and, and low DLCO were predictors of mortality and disease progression, again, like in any ILD cohort. Uh, 
So coming back to the original question, I, so I showed you that they, this population exists and, and that they, uh, the classification carries prognostic value. But going back to the initial question, should they, they be treated like IPF? And, and obviously it is, uh, I think the question is how do you best inform that decision of, of move forward in that direction? I think we all, uh, we all feel very comfortable being able to put patients in, in very distinct buckets. Now, if you have an IPF patient, you know for sure that that's the case, you're going to uh, take them for, uh, for lung transfer evaluation earlier. For, if your patient has CHP, you're going to work on, try to control the antigen. And if your patient has CTD, ILD, you are going to probably recommend immunosuppression therapy. But what if you're unable to put them on, in any of those buckets? How can you inform your decision to treat them like IPF? How, how do you move forward with it? And, and, and I think that I would pose the argument that you are left with two ways to try to inform your decision. You're either going to look at general characteristics of your patient that will tell you that either they, they will behave like the bad players here, or they're more likely to behave like the little guy in the middle that, that, um, that is less likely to progress and kill your patient. So again, baseline characteristics and disease progression. Those would be the way to inform your decision. So do we have evidence to, that allow us to, to use those two factors for, to make our decision? And I think we do. I think there's, there's some, some data that's, uh, that's showing up uh, in the literature. This is a very elegant work from um, Deja Degunsoi from the University of Chicago. And he looked at over 700 patients at the University of Chicago ILD database and, and did a cluster analysis and was able to identify four phenotypic clusters. The, ones on, the two on top are predominantly females, one of them uh, that had uh, a higher uh, uh, incidence of autoantibodies, and the two groups in the bottom were males. Um, one of them, both of them elderly white males, and one of them that honey, had honeycomb, which is, uh, which is group four. So the question is, your, your assignment to one of those clusters, it was a predictable of, of outcomes, and, and it did, and it was. So in the graph on the left, you have the traditional way to classify these patients, and on the, on the right, uh, you have the phenotypic cluster uh, outcomes, and you can see there's a very nice separation. So your, your, your patient's uh, baseline characteristics can inform, in many ways, how they, how they behave. So this is, again, a very elegant work published in CHEST uh, last year. So another way to look at uh, uh, your patient and predict how things will go is the disease behavior classification. This was proposed by an ATS work group uh, about six years ago. And there is a, a, a grading here, all the way from group one, where you have the so-called reversible self-limited conditions. Uh, the, the prime example will be the RBILD. And, and the idea here is just if you remove the trigger, uh, tell the patients to stop smoking in this particular uh, uh, example, they will do well and they will not progress, all the way to group five, uh, which is your progressive, irreversible uh, conditions, and that's where IPF resides. And, and your, your goals and, and your approach are essentially to slow progression, and again, refer to lung transplant. And, and where your patient will fall, uh, I think that um, it will be uh, very interesting to see if this potential classification actually portends a uh, uh, prognosis in a cohort of patients with, uh, with the population at hand here, which is the uh, unclassified by LD. This is a, a group from Scandinavia. It was published two years ago. They studied uh, 102 patients with deemed to have, to have unclassifiable ILD, and they apply the disease uh, behavior classification. And as you can see here, there's, again, very nice separation in terms of outcomes uh, or where they fall uh, in that spectrum. So coming back to the original question, I showed you that there is a good way to, uh, to the, the, the two ways to look at the population, looking at baseline characteristics and also disease behavior, uh, can help you make the decision. So what, what's the evidence that treating this population with antifibrotics, which is the underlying question of the title, uh, is? So what is the evidence? And this is, uh, this is brand new. This is the uh, inbuilt trial that was published, published recently. Dr. Flaherty uh, was the main investigator here. And we had 663 patients enrolled 
uh, in a one-to-one -one randomization, the patients have to have uh, significant fibrosis of more than 10% in HRCT and documented decline uh, in, in either a lung function or symptoms or imaging. Uh, and as you can see here, about 20% of the cohort was deemed to be unclassified by LD. So the patients uh, uh, in question were well represented in this particular clinical trial. And as you know, as you remember, there was a uh, uh, significant, uh, 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 significant delay in disease progression uh, or, uh, in the group that was randomized to Nintendanib, and that was true even for the group that, um, that uh, had EYP pattern uh, in the HRCT. So it, it was a positive study and led to, to uh, uh, FDA uh, designation of this drug for this particular group of patients with uh, progressive fibrotic lung disease. There was a clinical trial, that, uh, again published uh, uh, earlier this year, that is studied specifically the, the population of unclassifiable progressive fibrotic, fibrosing ILD. It was a, a, two, uh, a phase two trial conducted um, uh, uh, or led by Toby Maher from, uh, from England. Uh, and uh, two groups, one, uh, uh, 127 patients randomized to perfenidone, 126 patients randomized to placebo for 24 weeks. And they were, uh, they were deemed to be unclassifiable by MD, MDT discussion. And, and this is the interesting aspect of this trial, that the primary endpoint was actually the predicted mean change in FVC from baseline measured by daily home, home spirometry. Uh, and the secondary endpoint was the more traditional uh, laboratory measured uh, FVC. Uh, technical issues uh, with the home spirogram measurement prevented them from applying the planned statistical analysis to the primary endpoint, even though there was a signal in favor of, uh, of perfenidone, they could not, uh, again, determine uh, if there was uh, a statistical uh, difference here. But looking at pre-specified secondary endpoints, and, and specifically the traditional way to measure disease progression in, in, in ILD clinical trials, there was uh, an advantage uh, for the patients that uh, they were randomized to perfenidone, both uh, in terms of um, absolute decline in FEC as well as categorical change. So, coming, uh, coming back to the original question, you know, should we treat patients uh, with unclassified by ILD uh, uh, as IPF? I, I think the answer is yes at times. And, and when do I consider uh, antifibrotic uh, therapy in patients with, uh, with um, uh, unclassified by LD. Again, consider demographics, your clinical information, and the HRCT pattern in your biopsy findings. If your patient looks more like the, the group, th the cluster three and four of the Chicago group, and, and if you're dealing with a patient uh, who's a Caucasian male without any evidence of an autoimmune disease, and, and most importantly, if you have progressive behavior, like if you belong to group four or five, in a disease behavior classification, I think that certainly should be uh, a strategy that you need to consider and ought to consider. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Thank you Zhao. Time, time for questions? Yes, up here in the front, we have a, yes, behind you microphone. It was a race between two microphones, which we'll get here sooner. Congratulations uh, on again. So, um, since we have this new concept of IPATH, how do you feel that uh, affects the frequency of patients we will call unclassifiable LD? I think the classification is not a jail-free card, right? I think that the point that I made initially is that we really need to try very hard to classify them. Why is that relevant? Again, because there are upfront um, uh, strategies that you we implement uh, depending on the classification, right? An IPF patient, uh, I think, is a very unique uh, pro prognosis and, and you're more likely to uh, refer it for lung transplantation. I, I think that if your patient has IPATH or an autoimmune disease, you'll be, you'll be considering immune suppressive therapy as well. Again, I think we're entering a, uh, an interesting era where I think we are, we will be tempted to, to have, um, uh, to say, well, it doesn't matter how you call this, if it's progressing, uh, you should 
just use something like fibrotic. But I think there are certain nuances uh, of the classification and, and unique um, uh, behaviors that we need to, to continue to have an effort to classify them properly. Question in the back. Yeah. <clears throat> I appreciated your very elegant discussion of the unclassifiable ILD. I was riveted, however, by your early um, paper that you described the um, state of current non-classifying ILD as mm -hmm. opposed to unclassifiable. And how has that impacted your relations with the community of pulmonologists? Uh, and I ask partly as mm -hmm. leader of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation's Rural Health Working Group, mm -hmm. uh, interested in your insights as to how to change our level of practice in our community. Yeah, I, and I wrestle with that question. Uh, I think, uh, to me, uh, the, the key question, what's the best care model for IPF patients? Um, uh, I think that I've, um, it made me aware that we need to spend more time educating our colleagues uh, I think that we need to have a discussion as a community, again, should we move the direction that PH moved, creating regional centers of excellence that uh, they're easily or more easily accessible to our colleagues and community. I think that uh, Kevin has some work uh, that showed that uh, pulmonologists in the community had a lower threshold to call up a, a case IPF. Uh, in, in our particular work, um, we, we had a second portion to, the, to, the, to our project which was actually taking the information and the imaging and running through our MDD, and about a third of the cases we felt that had been misclassified. So um, I, I think that the, the way I see it, there's a lot of education that needs to occur, um, uh, it, not only with the pulmonology community, but also the radiology community. Um, uh, and, and I think we, have, we need to have a discussion as to what the best model of care of IPF patients or ILD patients is, and I don't have the answer to that. Zhao, I have one question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to, I don't know if challenge is the right word or maybe just try to maybe amend what you said a little bit or get your perspective on mm -hmm. this. I, if I follow out the logic of your recommendation, my worry is that because most unclassifiable patients are unclassifiable because they haven't had a biopsy, mm -hmm. and if the recommendation is in those patients to treat progressive behavior with antifibrotics, I feel like many clinicians may decide to forgo, and patients, to forgo biopsy because mm -hmm. the disease has been shown to be progressive and therefore we should just mm -hmm. treat it with antifibrotics. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that the current state of therapy mm -hmm. might put you in that direction, but yeah. we also feel like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis should at least probably have additional therapy mm -hmm. removal of antigens. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I guess the challenge there is how do you, uh, my, so my caveat would be yes, but only in patients who can't have surgical biopsy and can't is hard to define, but you understand my point. Oh, yeah. Can, can you yes, I, I, com I, I completely agree, and I think that's the point that I try to emphasize in, in the okay. final slide is that it is not a jail free card. You need to make an effort to, to really try to classify this patient for the reasons that you stated, right? I think that, particularly with CHP. Yeah, I'd be, I wish we had more time. It'd be interesting to see if people in the audience agree with that. I think that's an area that there is a mm -hmm. lot of debate, and yeah. it depends on how you weigh risks and benefits. And I think we recognize we come with a bias mm -hmm. to that. But oh, absolutely. Thank you, Jean, absolutely. very much.